Good morning and welcome to virtual worship with First United Methodist Church of Garland, Texas. I am Valerie Englert. I am the senior pastor and I am so glad and blessed that you have joined us. And I want to welcome you on this 10th Sunday after Pentecost. Those of you who are old friends and new friends that I have not yet met. Thank you for being here. As we worship, as we sing, as we pray together, let us seek the blessing of the Spirit. Hear now our call to worship. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. Lord, hear my cry and rescue me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, God who rules wind and water, stand by me. God stands with us in bright sunshine and deepest storm. God gently guides us to safety and peace. Thanks be to God, amen. Let us pray. No matter how strong the storm, how threatening the waves, Jesus calls us to trust in his love and mercy. Rejoice in his goodness. Rely on his power in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've started a new series today called The Three Simple Rules. So this little camp song will help us remember those three simple rules. I've recruited myself as the congregation to echo me. First, I will sing it by myself, and then I'll sing it with the congregation. And if you'll sing with the congregation, and then we'll sing it all together. So here it goes. Do no harm by any word or deed. Do good whenever there is need. Remain attentive to God's word. Stay in love with God. Stay in love with God. Okay, now this time, be my echo. Do no harm by any word or deed. Do no harm by any word or deed. Do good wherever there is need. Do good wherever there is need. Remain attentive to God's word. Remain attentive to God's word. Stay in love with God. 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 In love with God. Okay, this time we will all sing it together and here are the words. Do no harm by any word or deed. Do good wherever there is need. Remain attentive to God's word. Stay in love with God. Stay in love with God. Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now and together declare. We believe in God, the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the grant of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that, that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love 
as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Good morning. We now enter into this time of prayer together. During this time, you are invited to share your prayer request with us and everyone here in this virtual space. You can do that by typing the first name only of the person you would like us to pray for. Since we are using a social media platform, it is important that we respect everybody's privacy. In order to do that, we are asking that you only use the first name in your prayer request. You are welcome to add places, persons, or situations that are on your heart this morning. We will offer several spots in the morning prayer that will give you an opportunity to type your prayer request in the chat section. This morning, let us prepare our hearts and minds to be in prayer and communication with God. Together, let us pray for the people of this congregation and community. Let us also pray for those who, are, who suffer and are in trouble. Together, let us pray for the world, its people, and its leaders. And also for the Church Universal, its leaders, its members, and its mission. Finally, let us pray for the communion of saints. Lord, in your goodness and in your mercy, hear our prayers. Now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. One last thing. As we worship together this morning, you are invited to continue to offer your prayer requests in the chat area at any time. We also invite you to visit our prayer page on the church website. Simply go to firstmethodistgarland.org forward slash prayer. There you can enter the names of those you would like us to pray for and include in our prayer letter that is sent out to our congregation. May God bless each of you today. In the kingdom of God, we are led to give of our time, talent, treasures, and gratitude for the blessings that we have received. While our church building is closed, the church in you and in me is still on the move, working hard in our communities. Today, I get to share with you some of the things our church is currently involved in. We are currently collecting supplies for Freeman Elementary. On August the 24th, you will be able to drive up on 9th Street. Someone will come out and collect your donations. We're also collecting food for our quarterly trip to Austin Street Shelter. And that is happening on August the 30th. For more detailed information, you can visit firstgarland.org backslash missions. Also, I want to thank you for your financial faithfulness. Your gifts 
enables our church to minister outside the walls of our church, we will continue to make a difference in people's lives in Garland and surrounding communities. I invite you to give generously as you are able. May God bless.
Good morning, and welcome to worship this morning. My name is Caroline Knoll, and this is a time for students because it is back to school Sunday, and so many of our kids and our youth in the Garland area are going back to school this week, except they're not really going back because so many are beginning with school at home, at least for the first few weeks. So as we gather to pray for our new school year, I have someone to help us with that. This is St. Julian of Norwich. She lived hundreds of years ago, but I think her story can help us pray for our story and this new school year. Now, as much as her story can help us, we don't really know a whole lot about St. Julian's early life. We don't know where she was born or what her family was like. We don't even know her name when she was a little girl. St. Julian is the name that she was given, that she took when she lived in a little stone building built next to a church named, did you guess it? St. Julian's was the name of the church in a town called Norwich, which is in England. And St. Julian felt she could be closest to God when she was by herself. And so she stayed in this little stone house that was there for centuries. It had to be rebuilt after World War II, but you can still visit this place today. And so our first prayer is to lift up our homes and our school buildings and all the places, our churches, that help us feel close to God, to know that we are safe, where we will learn and grow this year. And we offer that prayer to God. Now, even though St. Julian was by herself in this little house, she wasn't always alone. Did you see the little figure that I showed you a minute ago? She's not by herself there either. Many people say that she had a cat that kept her company. And also people would come by the window of her little home because they wanted to talk to her. They knew that she was wise and holy. And so as we get ready to begin a new school year, we pray to God for those who are gathered with us in our homes, for those we will gather with on the screens, new teachers, new friends, and familiar faces, and pets and people in our homes to keep us company. And we pray for each and every one that will be gathered with us in this new school year to help it be a good year and a time when we know that we are not alone, even in our homes, that there are people who care for you and love you and are gathered with you, even if we can't be face to face right now. While she was in that home, St. Julian wrote. She actually wrote the first book that we know of that was written in the English language. There's a school for you. And one of the things that she wrote about was a dream or a vision or a thought that she had in which God showed her something that was so small, no bigger than a hazelnut. We don't have a lot of hazelnuts in Texas. Maybe no bigger than a little acorn. And St. Julian wondered, what is this thing that God is showing me? And God told her, this is everything that I have made. And she wondered at that. How could it be so small? How could something so small not just be crushed or just fall away? And God says, because I love it. 
because I take care of it. That is why you see it like this. I don't know, sometimes in this world, maybe you feel small, but the promise that we know is that God cares for even what seems like the smallest of creation, that God is with you and with all our students and our teachers and our schools. As she wrote and as she prayed, St. Julian did something else interesting. Sometimes she prayed to God, our mother, and not just God, our father. She thought we should use both so that we could know all of God's power and God's goodness, but also God's wisdom and God's love. You are about to be with new teachers and new leaders. And I pray that those teachers and those leaders share with you all of their goodness and their wisdom and their love, their kindness, that the fullness of God may be with you through those teachers. St. Julian had a lot of questions. She wondered a lot of things about God. She tried to figure out why God did the things God did. And I bet in school, you might have a lot of questions or your classmates might have a lot of questions or your teachers might have a lot of questions they want you to answer. But what St. Julian taught us was that all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. She came to know that everything that God does is done out of love. That's why God does the things God does because God loves you and your classmates and your teachers and our world that God loves you and me. And in this new school year, that's what I want you to know most of all, that you are a blessing. And I pray that the places where you are gathered and those who you are gathered with on the screens, that the things you study, that your teachers and all your questions help you know that you are loved and to grow and to be that wonderful creation just like God sees you. And to know that your church sees that in you, that I see that in you. And I can't wait until we are gathered again to be able to say that face to face. But until then, may this new school year bring you love and show you that you are a blessing. Peace to you students and prayers for this school year. Amen. And as Jesus sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick do. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come to call not the righteous, but the sinners. Holy wisdom, holy words. Amen. There are a lot of preparations underway for a new school year. And there are some new rules at the beginning of this new school year. Rules about being in the classroom, rules about virtual learning at home, rules about sanitation and masks and PPE and preparation of space so that everyone stays safe 
and healthy. All of these rules on top of the old rules from past beginnings of school. I remember a ritual in many classrooms at the beginning of school year was the setting of the rules for the classroom. The teacher would go up to the chalkboard or to the whiteboard and look at the class and say, what rules do we want to set for ourselves this year? And depending on what age group you're dealing with, you know, sometimes the rule would be use your inside voice, keep your hands to yourself, don't talk bad to a fellow student, turn your work in on time, all kinds of rules. And then the rules would stay there on the board throughout the year so that they could be referred to by a student or by the teacher if needed. And as people of the Methodist tradition of Christianity, um, we also have rules. And we're gonna spend today and the next couple of Sundays talking about those rules. There are three of them. But before we get to those, I want to hearken back to our Staycation Bible School, our virtual Vacation Bible School that we had just a few weeks ago when we took the week to consider the two greatest commandments. And those two greatest commandments were love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. These are the two commandments that Jesus commended to his disciples, not just the disciples around him at the time, but for all disciples throughout all time. But these commandments are how we are to conduct ourselves. These commandments are hallmarks of what it means to be Christian. And even though these commandments are familiar to many of us, we can often recite them by heart. Sometimes it is harder to live them out than easier. Sometimes it's a challenge to love our neighbor as ourselves. It could be a challenge to love our neighbor. It could be a challenge to love ourselves. It can be a challenge to love God with our entire being. And so I would like to suggest to you that the three simple rules that we are gonna be talking about over the next three weeks are a way to help us unpack those commandments a little further and perhaps can direct our living and direct our choices and direct our efforts as we seek to live out these two greatest commandments. In hearkening back to the earliest days of the Methodist movement, the Methodist movement began as a movement within the Church of England in the 18th century. Its founder was John Wesley, who was an Anglican priest. And as a young priest, he and his brother Charles and some friends sought to add fervor and intention to the practice of their faith. And as they did so, some societies grew up. And these were called the United Societies. The first one of which was John Wesley and a group of others who gathered on Thursday evenings to talk about the practice of their faith and to search the scriptures together and to pray together and to try to understand what salvation meant. And the societies grew and they grew to such a point that they had to divide further into what was called classes. And these were often 12 people and they would meet once a week. 
and do soul work together and read scriptures together and also talk about how they were going to serve out in their communities. And so the three rules that grew up out of these societies and these Methodist classes were three. The first of which is do no harm. The second of which is do good. And the third is stay in love with God. This is a modern language rendition of the three rules. And so today we're considering what it means to do no harm. It's very interesting to note that back during John Wesley's time in 18th century England and also in 17th century England, it was very common for parish priests, especially those who were serving in very small villages, to also be the dispensers of medical advice because doctors were so rare. And indeed, Mr. Wesley was very interested in medicine. He read medical treatises and did a lot of studying. And he even wrote his own book and it actually went through 23 editions. And it was called Primitive Physic. And it um, offered medical advice um, it offered advice for how to live well and holistically. Some scholars in the past have scoffed at his book as being full of old wives' tales and, and folk practices and that kind of thing. But scholars recently have come to see that Mr. Wesley's book of medical advice is much more than that, that it is... Um, tied in with his understanding of salvation, that salvation is not just about what happens to us after we die, but that salvation has everything to do with how we live now and how we understand ourselves to be whole beings in the image of God. So I'm not surprised that the first rule of the societies would be do no harm. This is a phrase which comes out of some ancient versions of the Hippocratic Oath. And I ran across a version of the Hippocratic Oath which goes back to the year 245. And there are a couple of lines from this that I would like to share with you. And so this would be an oath that a physician just beginning um, would utter. And it says, into whatsoever houses I enter, I will enter to help the sick and I will abstain from all intentional wrongdoing and harm, especially from abusing the bodies of man or woman, bond or free. And I think that the language of this is actually quite beautiful because it is the essence of doing no harm. It's a way of orienting ourselves in the world. And for Mr. Wesley, I think that he was not only pulling from the Hippocratic Oath there, but he was also pulling on the model of Jesus of Nazareth, who also lived in a way that did no harm. Jesus was not only a teacher, but a healer. And those who were the blessed recipients of Jesus' healing were often those who were on the margins of society. Lepers, those who had to actually live apart from their communities, hemorrhaging women who would have been ritually unclean. He raised the 12 year old daughter of Jairus, raised the son of the widow of Nain because she would have been without any community support without her son. 
And I think something that all of these people who received healing from Jesus, something that they all have in common is that they are acutely aware of their wounds. They are acutely aware of their need for healing. But then there are also those who think they've got it all right, that they're already healed and whole, such as the religious authorities in the scripture that we just heard. And the religious authorities' question to Jesus is, why are you hanging out with all of these low lives and nobodies? And Jesus' reply is, well, those who think they have it all together don't need a healer, do they? Or a teacher. I think when we look abroad at our own society, in our own communities, in our own cities, we see that there are a lot of wounded people. And just as in Jesus' time, there are people who are acutely aware of their wounds. They are acutely aware of the need for healing, not just in themselves, but in our communities. And then there are those who think that perhaps they're done with their wounds, that they don't need healing. And oftentimes what happens is when we receive a wound, we find the sole equivalent of a Band-Aid to put over it. And if we leave that Band-Aid there long enough, it turns into concrete, which turns into armor, which gets thicker and thicker and thicker. Because it is hard to admit that we have wounds. It is hard to be vulnerable and to say, we need healing. And coupled along with that is that if our armor is thick enough, we can brush up against other people and bruise them with that thick armor and not even be aware that we're doing it. Do no harm is a rule that if we truly take that into our being, can not only lead us in the direction of healing, it can lead us on the path of transformation of the whole world. It is an orientation to life. And if we resolve to do no harm in our choices and in our actions, what we find is that we are in the very footsteps of God in Christ. And as we walk that path, we find that we are not alone, that God in Christ is with us, offering grace and mercy and astonishing transformation. May it be so. Amen. For our students, our teachers, and our administrators, and our school staff, as you begin a new school year, remember that you are a blessing. Remember that you are loved. May you be well. May you have peace. Remember to choose joy. Remember that you are our future. Pray that you may find comfort. I pray that you will be blessed with creative ideas and have a song in your heart. This lit candle is a sign and a symbol of the presence of Christ with us as we worship together. And as we come to the end of worship, 
we will blow it out. But it doesn't mean that Christ's presence has left. It expands, it changes. It fills this space, fills our communities, fills our world, letting us know that the peace of Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit are with us now and always. Amen. Thank you.